All right, last video for this one, promise. Uh, how to perform an insulation test. Uh, again, last video I talked about it being a Fluke 1587. So that's what we're gonna use to explain it. Uh, the insulation tester itself is very similar to a DVOM that is normal, like you guys know how to use, and you use an Auto 50 or basic electrical or a tune-up and electrical. Um, it can be known in industry as a mega or a mega ohm mega, mega or a mega ohm meter. All it means is that its ohm testing capabilities are on steroids and that instead of producing a low voltage for an ohm test, it can produce up to a thousand volts for uh, an ohm test. That's really what we're checking for is we're doing an ohm test on steroids and instead of testing for say um, continuity uh, or not even just continuity but small amounts of resistance, we're checking for large amounts. Um, let me get out of here. Okay, and one thing I'd like to get into, I shouldn't have put this up on my board quite yet, just so we know where the big M is. So in class, I showed you guys how to use um, the STD chart. So we've got uh, our standard in the center. At this time, we're talking about ohms, right? And I know this is a little bit small here. Um, but if I go to the right, I get my little m, right, my milli ohms. We're not worried about that yet, that's another test. What we're worried about is everything on the left side of our chart. So if I go three places to the left, we get kilo, right? And if I go three more places to the left, we get big M or mega, and that's what we're looking for today on this test. We're looking for the big M or mega ohms. Um, if we don't have mega ohms, then we've got a problem. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, since our meter in this case for an insulation test is looking for mega ohms, it has to put massive amounts of voltage out, very minimal current, but massive amounts of voltage out in order to make that same fault show. Uh, and in this case, it can be up to a thousand volts, um, which is not gonna hurt you because the current is very, very, very minimal. The issue is that it's probably not gonna feel good, right? The, you know, to get tased by your meter. So you're gonna wanna use high voltage gloves on this one. Uh, normally in class, when I talk about this, I'd show you guys the leads, I turn off the lights, I put the leads not touching, but just close to each other, and I will hit the insulation test and you can actually see the spark jump because it's got so much voltage. So you don't wanna get shocked by that. You will definitely feel it, feel it and, um, you know, you may need to change your pants after. So, um, in the picture on the side, you can see the gentleman is using high voltage gloves, even though the component he's testing is out of the vehicle because he's not using it for the high voltage battery pack. He's using it because that meter can shock you as well. And of course, I'm doing that to me again. Let's try to get back to where we're at here. How to love 365. Have I ever told you guys how much I love 365? <laughs> okay, now the procedure itself, let me get out of this so we are not confused on what we're talking about here. The insulation procedure itself, uh, first things first, like any other own test, you need to isolate what you're working on because now we are changing the power source. So you, and we want to make sure it's safe to work on, right? So you are going to isolate whatever you're testing. If it's a motor generator, you're gonna unbolt the terminals and you are going to take that out of the system. Uh, same with power inverters, everything else. You wanna make sure that you're isolating it from the rest of the system. So you're also uh, reading accurately where the problem is, right? So just as an example, uh, on here, he's showing where you're gonna hook the meter up to and what button you're gonna press, it's pretty obvious. Everything is labeled insulation test um, or insulation tester. Um, but before you do all that, you're gonna to need to select the appropriate voltage scale. So uh, you need probably a tad over what you are actually working on 
For a lot of systems, 500 volts may be just fine. You're working on a much higher voltage system, or you're working on something like, uh, so you're working on something like a Tesla, or you're, you're working on something like a Rivian, or you're working on something like uh, a Porsche Taycan. Um, you're definitely going to need a higher voltage system scale. So, like I said, it goes up to a thousand volts. Uh, most of the time, you're going to need at least 500. Even if we're talking like a 200 volt system, you can get high voltage uh, spikes, and we want to make sure that we are testing to that, right? So maybe the isolation fault only happens under spikes. Well, if I only test system voltage, then that doesn't show me anything and the fault might not show up. So um, choose the appropriate voltage scale. Once you're ready, you're gonna need to hook the voltage tester up. So I like using alligator clips for this one, unless you have multiple hands or multiple people using it uh, or testing, um, but you can Touch one lead to chassis ground or wherever your concern the leak might be to. So if I'm testing a motor generator, nothing should be connecting to the case itself, right? Because that would be dangerous. So I'll hook my alligator clip up uh, for my ground on the case itself. And I've got a picture of that actually here. My red lead is going to go to whatever high voltage component I think is leaking to ground or, or to chassis ground or to the case or whatever it might be. So if I think it's the, uh, if we're drawing phases inside the motor, and I know I'm getting a little bit advanced here because uh, we haven't talked about it yet, but our motors are three phase, so they're sort of coils and wire, right? Well, three phase kind of looks like this if we're just gonna draw a quick diagram about it. None of these phases should be, and actually let me just make this a different color here. Um, let's use green. If I've got a case around here, these phases, that's a horrible picture, I apologize. But these phases are all going to be connected, not connected, I'm sorry, connect to cables coming out of the motor, we'll say here, here, and here. We don't want them touching each other and we don't want them electrically connected to the case. They're gonna go straight out, usually to the power inverter. Um, so we can either uh, turn them on or off however we please. I'm not gonna get into that yet because it's a little bit uh, Going ahead there, um, Mr. O'Connell in a future one will be doing electric motors. So if I want to test if any of these phases are connecting to ground, then I am going to connect to my case and then my red lead is gonna go to whichever one of these. Um, on the electric motor, it doesn't matter which one you choose. If one of these have faulted to ground, then all of them will because of the way that they're connected. On a power inverter, however, so if instead of an electric motor, I've got, let's say, a power inverter. I'll just put PI here. And I've got those same three cables because, again, like I said, they connect uh, to, I've got three cables that are going to connect to my electric motor. Because of the way it's connected, I will need to check each one of these three phases uh, to make sure. We are going to have you guys do this uh, as a bench test at school um, once we get back into lab. So you guys will know exactly what that's like. So let's talk a little bit more about, okay, I've connected it. What do I do next? Once you've connected it, you're going to press in the picture here. The gentleman is pressing a large orange button. They make leads that have a button inside of it. I'll show you guys how to use those when we get back to lab. Um, when you touch it and you're ready to test, you are going to press that button. And the button is going to, you're gonna to wanna to press it um, for at least two seconds, give it a chance to sort of send that voltage through. Within two seconds, you should have a reading up on your meter. Now that reading is gonna tell you whether or not that component is the isolation fault or you need to move on and test something else. So what is acceptable? Uh, on the slide here, I've already given you that information. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this so we can talk about some of that. 
Um, but if you're looking at the PowerPoint presentation, um, as far as standards go, your OEM programming, as, I, as Mr. O'Connell talked about, the actually safety system that's monitoring this is going to need some sort of threshold, right? When will it actually turn a mill on? How far can it go? Um, and really, the programming has uh, a tolerance of about uh, 500 ohms per volt in the system. So uh, if I've got um, five, uh, or, or let's say I've got a 200 volt system, and I know that I need 500 ohms per volt, I can just multiply 500 by 200 and I get 100,000, right? So that means I need 100,000 ohms, at least. If I don't, the mill's gonna set. And most of the time, the OEMs are gonna actually increase uh, that threshold a little bit. So at bare minimum, if it's 100K, it'll set a mill at 150K. Um, however, your readings are generally going to be higher than that if the system is good. If we're falling down around this minimum threshold, something's probably uh, wrong. And if we're talking something like a motor generator, what we're really looking to see is something along the lines of 550, or I'm sorry, at least, okay, here, jumping ahead, at least five mega ohms. Most of the time you'll see 550 mega ohms, um, but that's usually the highest that your meter goes, um, depending on the setting, sometimes it's giga ohms. Uh, but that's where the threshold is. That's what you'll generally see. So if you see, um, like I said, five mega ohms on a motor generator is going to be bare minimum. Um, but uh, what you'll generally see if the system is good is 550 mega ohms. Um, we don't want any connection at all whatsoever. Uh, so that's what we're looking at here. And that's how you perform an insulation test or a test for an isolation fault. It's actually a pretty easy test. The hardest thing about it is to get to the actual component that you need to test. And a lot of times, it's very easy. Some cases, not so much. Um, so the amount of time it's going to take you is really dependent on vehicle and component. Uh, but you guys will do a lot more of this when we get back into the lab. So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please post on the discussion board and I can help you guys out there. Uh, thank you guys.